Francisco, as one of the astronaut conferences, and we have with Kieran and uh, Kevin, all of you. So that's really my pleasure. And um, so I'm actually going to move a little bit focus a little more to speak into a philosophical way. I'm a philosopher. I am one of the organizers and founders of the Costuma Research Group. But almost, almost all of you are part of this, so we should be proud of such a good, nice group going on. And I was a teaching uh, at the New York uh, Liberal uh, NYU, uh, New York University. I teach philosophy there. All right, so my talk is Glamorous Metabodies, the Politics of Amorphogenesis and the Will to Global Surveillance. Am I also going back into more of a traditional way to do academia? Sorry, I thought it was a little more um, traditional setting and, and I'm reading. So I hope it's not disturbing you. I'm trying to be not, I'm trying not to be boring. But the beginning is a little tough, and then it gets a little uh, more uh, smoother. We are glamorous metabodies in amorphogenetic processes of constant becomingness. The desire for surveillance is an attempt to reconstitute the order of things. A panoptical Google Map interactive picture of hyper realities in the anthropocentric genealogy of the Wild Master. In tune with new materialisms, the Lesson Guatemi, Yoga, Rainbows, and Her Stories, Metabodies Park, multiversal passages from nowhere to everywhere, and vice versa. Embodied narratives and impure potential. In this talk, we will explore the significance of losing the body and accessing post-biological embodiments as intra-acting ecologies of relations, diffractions, and absolute humanness. <coughs> body. Body is an English term used to define a broad human notion which describes amongst other meanings, the physical structure and material substance of an animal or plant, living or dead, a person, a collective group. One notion does not erase the other. For instance, my body right now is part of a social body, formed by you and me, placed in a special body, which includes this room. The line drawn between bodies are based on scale we have an expert on scale here, thank you. And symbolism. Another two experts of symbolism are right here too, so we are in the right place to talk about this. The symbolic emphasis could be placed on this event as part of the body of work of the metabolic research. A special body could be expanded from this room to this building to New York and so on. So told is the body is never one but many. Their borders are shifting and provisional. Bodies contain other bodies, which contain other bodies, in a game of mirrors with no ending. If taken on a superficial level, this notion of body can be assimilated to the one of object within the object-oriented ontological movement, but they are radically different. When we think of bodies, we think of material, symbolic, multiversal networks in constant evolution. So the correlationality here is not lost at all. They are cultural constructions as well as material diffractions. And it's funny because this one was based on the idea that, that like bodies can be alive, can be dead. And I took off the phrase and the, the, the slide is still here, but so I was talking with all these um, dead bodies behind me. This is a, a, a performance, a performance by the way. But the idea was that a like, body can uh, mean an alive body, a dead body, doesn't matter. And, uh, and here was the idea that like body are within other bodies, within other bodies, and they think of scale. Um, okay, metabodies. Meta in Greek, as uh, Jaime was saying, means change, transformation. Think of the word, of course, metamorphosis. It comes from Vedic Sanskrit, mitu or mita, which means to tie, to connect. As a prefix, it means after, along with, beyond, among, behind. Also, in epistemology, the prefix meta is used to mean about in relation to its own category. So each body is a metabody in the sense that a body is the condition sine qua non we have bodies. 
In other terms, I am a body and I have a body. Actually, we don't have just bodies. We have glamorous bodies, anthropocentric bodies, bodies, fashionable bodies. Look at all this fake gold here. Look at Corita coming in. Let's not forget that when we think of bodies, the human body is the first signifies to come to mind, exposing the human-centric dialectics of the term. Do animals, plants, and machines have bodies as humans do? Body is a human concept created in a human language. While its connotations may vary depending on context and association, for instance, the animal body, the plant body, the celestial body, the denotation of the body is the human body. So we don't want to forget that. The body is a human concept and it's created in a human language and we often we think of bodies, we think of human bodies. So why not talking about the human body? And see, such denotation manifests itself as an assemblage of different connotations. Phenomeno phenomenologically, the human body appears multiple and situated. Its symbolic meaning and social reception must shift depending on its gender, race, age, ethnicities, physical and intellectual capabilities. The body itself is constantly reshaping and defining its boundaries. Think of the pregnant body, the menstruating body, the aging body, the sick body. So first of all, not all, the, not all the human bodies are the same bodies. Think of age, race, ethnicity, and capabilities. And on the other side, the body is this constant, constant metamorphosis, which is always reshaping. Again, the pregnant body, the, the, the aging body, the sick body. Signifier, for an extensive range of signifieds, the body reveals its absolute centrality to the construction of social narratives. In other words, giving a body means offering ontological recognition, it is a political act. A body is culturally constituted by morphogenesis which in biology is the process that causes an organism to develop its shape. In Greek, uh, morphe means shape and genesis means creation. So now let's go to amorphogenesis. Hannes was talking about it and is also in the title of this talk. Amorphogenesis on the other side stands as the brave look at the chaotic, rhizomatic interaction of matter. The glossary of the metabolic project describes amorphogenesis as the ongoing emergence of movement without form. By losing control over the symbolic significance of shapes, we are allowing movements to flow, and the gaze not to be like the one of Medusa, which would turn the onlookers into stone. So this is not just a pen, it can be many things, okay? But the idea of like the shape is going to define an identity, so we want to open multiple identities. It is like someone running or dancing. The picture you're going to take of their action is never going to reflect the actual performance, since that performance is in movement. Your picture will only capture one specific moment. So think of someone running and you take a picture, that is not going to define the run, it's going to define a specific moment of the run, okay? Recognizing the ontological natural culture of existence in movement, so not as something fixed but in movement, is a major paradigm shift which bridges the so-called soft sciences to the hard ones. Think, for instance, of string theory, according to which everything in the universe is comprised of tiny vibrating strings. Passing to quantum physics and new materials, this shift allows for the recognition of dynamism in ontological terms. A movement is necessarily relational. Thus, we can speak of relational ontology to use Karan Barat's term. An effective visual example of such dynamic interrelated trade is the amorphogenic architecture of the Metabody project. And I'm presenting much more on this, so I'm not going to get into details, but in which the whole structure is affected by, and vice versa, is affecting the moving body. There is no strict separation between those bodies, which become a hyper-real assemblage of virtually endless possibilities. And see, if I ask you right now what you see in the metamorphant, metamorphant, metaformance, many of you will describe a human body. 
moving between projections, shadows and screens. But is that body human? Would some other species perceive such an, such an assemblage in a different way? For instance, would a whale recognize in such a metaformance a human body? Or would it see the shape of a fish floating in the ocean? Autopoiesis. Here, it is important to note that our perception of reality is intrinsically related to our autopoietic system. Humans share a species-specific access to existence through their autopoietic organization. Even though each and every human being has a different and unique way to form their own phenomenological experience, their cognitive apparatuses are similar, while they structurally differ from, ones, from the ones characterizing other animals, as emphasized by Maturana and Varela. Their notion of autopoiesis was based on the experiment described in the paper What the Frog's Eyes Tested Frog Brain, was done in 1959, which demonstrated that the frog's visual system operates very differently from a human one. Here I would also like to add that the notion of species should not be taken for granted either. When reflecting upon species from a genetic point of view, for instance, a kinship can be recognized, but not an assimilation. Human beings are 99.9% identical at the DNA level, but no two human beings are genetically identical to each other due to their genetic variation. And so is existence. Evolution does not move towards complexity, but towards diversification. It is not a matter of hierarchy, but is a matter of recognizing the intrinsic, intrinsic creative drive which brings along changes, mutations, possibilities. The birth of philosophy. Why? This question can never be fully answered because existence is in movement. This is why philosophy is always new, is always needed, is always rethinking itself. Because the answers to why or what are never going to be the same. In a similar way, who I was 10 years ago is not who I am today, although we are related. I have changed, and everything around me has changed as well, like in the amorphogenic architecture of the Megaboli project, a distributed existential cognition. Existence is a cosmic dance. Nothing will ever be the same. The eternal recurrence can be thought as a spiral more than a circle, but changing does not necessarily bring along changes. The fact, the fact that there are unlimited possibilities does not mean that they will be actualized. Such potential may be spent in the attempt to reiterate social narratives in the repetition of normative habits and behaviors. Space-time hold memory. We need to take his stories and her stories in serious consideration when thinking of the future since time is not linear, and the past and the future are embedded in the movement and in the moment of the present. If existence is shifting and dynamic, the will to master and the contemporary attempt to ontological surveillance by technological control, control are only an illusion. In other words, if there cannot be a definitive and all-encompassing human understanding of the post-human distributed unconscious, if, to say with Heraclitus, no human can ever step in the same river twice, since everything flows from the ray, grasping reality by recording it, categorizing it, archiving it, is a mirage. And still, Calderon de la Barca believed that life is a dream, and dreams are not less real their reality. Surveillance. We live in public. We have always lived in public. The large majority of humans throughout history have lived in material conditions which would not allow for a sense of privacy in the modern sense of the word. When many people share the same room or the same cave, the individual space is absorbed within the tribal perception. Another example of public life is the child. 
whose bodily functions can be publicly displayed. The desire for surveillance is an attempt to reconstitute the order of things. On one side, the glam look of our fashionable human bodies calls for attention. Social media visibility is related to self-identity. I exist because other people see me. In the economy of social control, this pattern works both ways. You want to be seen in society, and society wants to see you, know you, everything about you. In this mirror in which I self-sacrifice my individual space for the recognition I deserve, the border is lost. We are watching you for your safety, for your existential security. There is no you without our gaze. The generative power of the gaze of Medusa. I am being watched, therefore I am. We do not spy on you to understand who you are or to observe you like in a zoo. We spy on you to give you an identity, to help you realize that you exist, so that you can help us realize that we exist. Because you are us, because you know that we might be watching you behind the camera, and we might not, the mystery of the panopticon society. Because you know that all of your emails are automatically screened, sometimes archived. Because you know that today I am watching you, and tomorrow you may be watching me, and God has always been watching us. But now that God is dead, we need a substitute. And now we have technology everywhere. We will never be alone again. Even if you are not watching me, you may watch that video recording of my glamorous journey to the supermarket. Tomorrow, one year from now, or after I die. We used to take a picture to remember the moment. Now we take a picture to preempt the memory. The beauty of the panopticon society. I spy on you, you spy on me. It's a game and it's fun until the thumb up of a life become a pointed finger. Shock you. From the news. In 2009, Ashley Payne, a public high school English teacher in Georgia, lost her job because of this picture. Taken in the Guinness Brewery in Ireland during a European summer vacation. This is real, this is coming from the news, this is a true story. The 24 year old teacher was accused of promoting alcohol consumption on her Facebook page and she was given a choice resign or be suspended. It is important to know that Payne had used the privacy settings on Facebook and that an anonymous email with a picture was sent to the director of the school. Case number two, US 2013, Georgia school bus driver Johnny Cook was upset after a student on his bus said that he was denied lunch because he owned 40 cents. Cook voiced his concern on Facebook and he said, this is what he wrote on Facebook, this child is already on reduced lunch and we can't let him eat. Are you kidding me? The next time we can feed a kid for 40 cents, please call me and we'll scrape up the money. Cook wrote on May 21st. Two days later, Cook was fired over the post. Case number three, US 2014, one year ago. And there are so many more cases, obviously. These are just some, some examples. A second grade teacher posted on Facebook a picture of a dairy farm using crates to house baby cows. The teacher, who is also a vegan and an animal rights advocate, said that it was inhumane to sit separate the cows from the mothers. In return, when it came to when it came time to renew this contract, the school board said said that they could not be okay. In return, when it came time to renew his contract, the school board said they could not because the farm that owns the calves complained about this post. These examples are unsettling. No laws have been broken, and still the citizens were denied the continuation of their contracts. The risk is random, unexpected, unpredictable. It nourishes the vast land of fear, self-censorship, and intimidation, posing a serious threat to the First Amendment and to freedom of speech. But there is no easy conclusion. The Panopticon has lost the central tower. This is the transparent society. Everyone is watching everyone. The anonymous friend on Facebook can have you fired. The guards are watching the prisoners. The prisoners are watching the guards. And sometimes being watched is not a bad idea. In the US, 
the adoption of wearable cameras by the police is currently seen as a partial solution to achieve police, police accountability, as a response to the non-numerous cases of police brutality, impunity, and racial profiling. What study was conduct conducted in 2012? Cameras were deployed to all patrol officers of the police department in Rialto, California. The results were encouraging, as the authors conclude. The findings suggest more than 50% reduction in the total numbers of incidents of use of force compared to control conditions, and nearly 10 times more citizen complaints in the 12 months prior, prior to the experiment. And still, some bodies move faster than light. They cannot be recorded on camera. The astral body, the ethereal body, the subtle body, as described in the Bhagavad Gita, the rainbow body, as depicted in Tibetan Buddhism. Until now, we have reflected upon the glam and the stickiness of the panoptical society. But what happens when no case is unfair? Neither the physical nor the technological part. As previously noted, humans are tribal animals. But at, at the same time, the need for solitude, privacy, social silence is traceable to the very beginning of the history of spirituality. Individual space allows for a type of connection to existence which is not socially bounded, and it has been historically granted a specific role as the condition for a spiritual search which may eventually lead to enlightenment. The, the word hermit comes from the Greek eremites of the desert. Think of Moses on the Mount Sinai, think of Jesus or Muhammad in the desert, think of the Nietzschean Zarathustra coming down from the mountains to show his vision after 10 years of solitude, silence, non-verbal, non-human communication. The social categories who, under patriarchal historical terms, were not allowed the freedom to live for the unconditional search, such as women or slaves, could find a space within the body, which is many. Closing the eyes, for instance, may offer a complete reappropriation unlimited space, silence, infinity, pure potential, prayers, meditation. Think of it, for instance, of the rich tradition of medieval and Renaissance women mystics, from Hildegard Bingen to Catherine of Siena, from Joan of Arc to uh, Teresa of Aguilar. Bodies in ecstasy, light bodies, which are part of our multiversal bodies, material and potential networks, de-quantified selves, often lost in translation. And I am going to the conclusion, which is about metahumanism. Deeply related to a Deleuzean legacy, metahumanism emphasizes the body as a locus for amorphic resignifications, extending in kinetic relations as a body network. Critical and ethical transformation of the human into an undetermined potential, a nameless amorphogenesis, opening up the potentials of a body to affect and to be affected. This comes also from the metabolic um, website. Now, the human within this type of framework is dehumanized in the sense that it has lost its human shape to allow for an indefinite number of possibilities to manifest. The loneliness of the Western subject is lost in the recognition of the otherness as co-creating the self. Unconscious cognition, non-human agency, we exist in a material net in which everything is actually connected and potentially interactive. A network of energies, alliances, waves, reflections, diffractions. Be fully aware of your cosmic dance, as everything around you is aware of it. And smile. You are on the camera of existence. God is watching you, and you are watching God. In the memory of space-time, Nothing will be lost, and nothing will be, and nothing will ever be the left. This was a beautiful ending. Wait a second. <laughs> In the memory of space time, nothing will be lost, and nothing will ever be the same. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>